So um, design for social change, what does it mean? And when we're talking about change of uh, societal behaviors at a very large scale, uh, what does design mean in that context? I'm going to use the story of sanitation in India to illustrate my points. Uh, I must warn you all, if you're a little squeamish, brace, uh, brace yourself. This is a tough, tough topic. So let's rewind a little bit. Okay? You woke up in the morning today, probably the same time that you normally do. You went into your bathroom, you did your job, you flushed, and you forgot. And you came over here with another thought to this whole affair. right? But what if? What if none of this was possible? What if you lived here or here? Right? where it wasn't a reflex action, but it had to be a planned every single day. When you go, where you go, wh what time, all of that stuff, if all of it had to be planned. Unfortunately for millions of us in our country today, it's not a what if, it is the reality. Half of India's 1.2 billion people don't have a toilet at home. And in rural areas, it is two thirds of the population. And out of those that do, they don't have access to what is called improved sanitation safe sanitation. So the situation is pretty dire. But the implications are, go far beyond just, being in, just be, uh, causing inconvenience. It's really a public health issue. Look at these numbers, right? We're talking millions of viruses, one million bacteria. These are mind-boggling numbers. And this is why we have the rest of the problems. 1,000 children under five die every single day because of diarrhea. The disease burden that the country bears, 22% of that is because of undernutrition and malnutrition and diarrhea related diseases. This is completely preventable. There is no need to have that today. There was a study by uh, WSP of the World Bank, and uh, they said that, they estimated that inadequate sanitation is causing India approximately 6.4% of its GDP. And that's because 70% of that is because of premature death and uh, poor health. Uh, it's also because of lack of productivity, uh, lack of time, uh, loss of time, education, and a whole lot of things, right? There's also a clear correlation between the access to a toilet and infant mortality. And so you see the numbers there. Tamil Nadu, which is much higher on the toilet coverage, has a lower infant mortality rate compared to Bihar. So there's enough studies to show what the current situation is. And there was, a there was one study that came out a year ago, many of you might remember it, it caused a huge amount of debate in the country. There was an uproar so when, when we found that 59% of the country, uh, uh, households in the country had access to uh, cell phones and only 49% had access to toilets. And people, there were heated debates saying, what kind of development model do we have if you're going to allow a situation like this, right? And this brought a lot of attention to the situation of sanitation which has been a problem for a long time, actually. So let's use this opportunity to look at the sanitation journey in the country, right? Where before the 1980s, which was not very long ago, I know many of you were not born then, but 1980 was quite recent. At that time, there was no budget for sanitation. In the, in the national budget, there was no allocation for sanitation at that time. And this, for the first five-year five, uh, five -year plans, there was no allocation. And then in 19 between 1980 to 90, that was when we had the international decade for drinking water and sanitation, and that's when Government of India's uh, program started for sanitation. At that time, the coverage, the access to toilets in the country was 1%, 1% of the whole country. So the India's sanitation program started in 1986, um, and at that time, it was a very simple idea. Sanitation meant building toilets. And there was one model of technology, one model of toilets, right? And that was built everywhere. 90 lakh toilets were constructed in the 1990s. A lot of money was spent, but it didn't work. So you go all across rural India and you see signs like this. Basically, construction is not usage, right? And so you peel a layer and go a little deeper. Why? Why doesn't it work? For one, the quality of construction is poor. Would you really want to go in that? There's no pan there, and if there is a pan, there are no walls there, right? It's stuffy, dark, and smelly. Little kids actually get scared of going inside these closed spaces with a pit. And so Government of India said, okay, we need an improved model, and then we came out with this, you know, this new improved uh, sanitation model where there were vents to take away the odor, windows, and uh, safe disposal. 
water and sanitation was jointly implemented so that you could have water to clean the toilets, because that was one of the other problems. Right? But then usage crept up, but it was still very slow. So you peel another layer and say, what's going on here? Right? And you find that really there's no demand for toilets. You'll see pictures like this everywhere, where the thinking is, why do you want to waste a perfectly good space? If somebody's building you a room, then put your goat in it. You need a room for the goat. Or you put your hay in it, or any of the other household belongings. You're battling a lot of tradition, centuries old tradition, which says toilet inside the house is unclean. You have to go outside and do it. I mean, our grandfathers and great grandfathers used to talk like that. And frankly, if you look at the alternative, going out in the open is so much nicer, right? And we've been doing this for centuries. And unfortunately, also, the connection between sanitation, hygiene, and health, all those horrifying numbers that I just showed earlier, that connection was not made. I've been in surveys where we've asked women, we've asked men, what do you think causes diarrhea? Because it's a constant, it's a very big issue for them. And invariably, they say things like, it's an evil eye, something bad, somebody's casting a bad eye on us, or there's some bad things that are coming here. There is no connection made. And if you don't have that connection made, then you're not going to want a toilet, to want to use a toilet. So where did that leave us? We were building lots of toilet, uh, toilets, but the usage was poor, the maintenance was poor, and it was slowly becoming clear that it's not a technology issue, it's not a financing issue, though both of those would help. It's essentially a, an issue of motivation. It's, an essential, uh, it's essentially a need for behavior change to actually want that toilet, to say that I will go in a toilet, I can't, I'm done with going out in the open in that continuous stink, I'm done with putting myself and my family in danger, right? So when the government in 1999, after years of feedback and review, said, I think it's time for reforms, and in 1999, sector reforms were introduced, where the whole mindset was changed, at least in the sanitation schemes, and it became more demand-driven and community-led. And uh, moving away from the idea of building toilets, we now came to an outcome. So going from outputs to an outcome of open defecation-free, that is the goal that people wanted. And also understanding that sanitation is really like a public good. right? You need everybody to participate in it so that everyone can avail of those health benefits. And to make it work, there were changes made in the scheme where there was a lot more focus on awareness. There was um, subsidies given for the below poverty line and supply chain. So a lot of other details went into making this work. And so you can see the graph slowly. You can see the numbers creeping up. And things were looking good. Uh, but it was still not fast enough. So in 2003, the government said, OK, let's introduce this new idea of collective incentivization. Because sanitation is only effective when it's, 100, when it's practiced 100%. So uh, there was a new scheme uh, started called the Nirmal Gram Puraskar. And the idea was financial incentivization. If a Gram Panchayat is able to be 100% open defecation free, not 100% toilet coverage, because that's not the same, 100% open defecation free, nobody is defecating in the open, they get a cash prize. And that varies between 0.5 to 5 lakhs based on the population. And then they expanded it to say for an entire block or an entire district. Right? Then the numbers started going up really well. So at the end of um, 19, uh, yeah, 2010, the numbers, it said 65%, actually it's 75, uh, 74 as of two years, a year ago. And there was a separate ministry also set up for drinking water and sanitation. So basically things were looking very good. But unfortunately, it's not a happily ever after story. While the budgets were rising, and now it's at 3,500 3, crores, this uh, total sanitation campaign, which is the scheme, there were still a lot of discrepancies. So what you see in this graph here, the green line are the numbers reported by the ministry in terms of the coverage. And it said at the end of last year that we have about 70% coverage, access to toilets in the country. Right? Then the census also happened in 2011 and a couple of other surveys. And they went and checked how many houses actually had access to toilets, how many were using them. And they found that that was 34%, less than half. So that meant we have to go back to the drawing board. And we have to relook at this and understand what's going on. We're still much better off than we were in 1980. But we are a long way from saying we're, you know, we're done with this problem. So where, where does that leave us now? 
like I said, there are many models that in these last three decades that have been tried and that are successful. And now the work is to really understand from those models, understand the conditions, and redefine, uh, refine the design of these models. Right? I'm going to give one example, which is uh, fairly central to the whole sanitation conversation today. And that's the idea of subsidy. You guys are the entrepreneur cells, so you'll understand this, the idea of incentives and subsidies and uh, you know, what motivates people. Right? So there are two camps here. One camp says, look, you know, we're talking about a lot of poor people, and not just poor. We're talking about the elderly. We're talking about disabled. We're talking about people, people who are chronically sick, AIDS, diabetes, people who, are, who don't have any support. And if we want high levels of sanitation, then we're going to have to support them. Sanitation, to have proper sanitation, is a, it's a basic human right to live in dignity. So everybody needs it, and therefore subsidies are necessary. And they cite the case of Tripura, which has 91% coverage. And um, you know, saying, look, that's why this model worked. On the other camp, you have the ones which are completely against subsidies. And they go, no, this is a question of behavior change. You can't incentivize behavior change with money. It just won't last. It's not financially sustainable. And the numbers, if you look at the total sanitation campaign, 88% of the money is going for hardware subsidies. And 12% is for running the program. So they think we can't really continue with those kinds of numbers. So you should do away with the subsidy completely. You're going to create a cycle of dependency and expectation. So do away with that. You're also going to distort the market. And just go ahead and work on behavior change. And Haryana, another state, um, has achieved very good results, 79%, out of which Sirsa, the district, is completely open defecation free without one rupee in subsidies. So you have both sides here. I'll talk a little bit about both the models and talk about, you know, as a, as a way of understanding how design played a role in trying to figure out how societal behavior can be uh, affected. And these have very large implications. You're talking about a country of 1.2 billion people. So one model, one example of this model is the Gram Vikas model. Uh, Joe Mariat, he's a hero in the sanitation space. He moved when he was a college student to Orissa to provide in uh, cyclone relief and then ended up staying there in the remote tribal areas for the next 30, 40 years. So he's uh, completely transformed, uh, done a lot of work in that area. And with that model there is about 100% inclusion. No compromise on that. Everybody has to get a toilet. And to incentivize, to, to um, you know, encourage the um, villagers, the idea is that everybody wants water, because water is something that you know, they're all uh, um, extremely motivated to get. So they said, you first have to build your toilets, and only then we'll get you water. And they get the village to sign off to make a commitment on that. And they actually contribute. They may not contribute money, but they give labor and they give materials. And in the 350 villages that this was implemented, there's been no slippage. Slippage is a word that we use when we say that something that was used in the initial time then uh, uh, has gone into disuse. So this, the, the function, uh, you know, the toilet usage has slipped back. People are no longer using it. But in this area, for instance, there's been absolutely no slippage. And uh, they don't even like calling it subsidy. They say we're giving financial support to, uh, for the case of dignity, for building dignity. Right? And like I said, the, another essential point here is the, there is no question of compromise. You wouldn't want to go into a dirty, stinky toilet. Why do you assume that the poor would want to do that? So every house gets a private toilet, a bathroom, 24-7 running water, and three taps with running water in the kitchen, toilet, and bathroom. And as you can see in the pictures, people are very happy with their toilets. There's no question of not using it. Uh, in cases where they don't have space for toilets, they actually uh, build a toilet block elsewhere, and every house gets a key to their own toilet, right? which they lock and keep clean. Um, the streets, the, in that whole, all those tribal areas, very clean, very uh, hygienic, beautifully maintained. In fact, uh, one of those houses there is where Rahul Gandhi came and stayed. And when you go there, when I went there for a visit, the first thing they'll do is they'll point that out and they'll say with pride, he came and stayed here with us. Uh, these guys are a poster child for uh, good sanitation. On the other side of the camp is the community-led sanitation uh, model. And this was found by another, founded by another pioneer, Kamal Kar. And there, the idea is uh, no subsidy. That's the big difference. Uh, but it's about a community coming to awareness about its own sanitation practices. 
It's about mm -hmm. analyzing its sanitation profile and activities which are going to ignite disgust and actually a realization of what the impact of lack of sanitation is, and then saying, we're going to be we are going to use toilets, we're going to build toilets. Uh, it's low cost because there's no subsidy and it scales easily. It's been running in 135 districts affecting 5 million people. So like I said, it's about triggering a community into action. It starts off with a walk of shame. So the facilitator will walk with the community in the village to all of their open defecation points, right? And actually stand there with them at, in the open defecation points where they're surrounded by shit and use the local word for shit in the conversations, in the reg rest of the conversation that happens with the community and say, so is this where you come to shit every day? Uh, did you come here yesterday? How many of you come here and shit every day? Do your dogs come to this area? And it's extremely awkward if you're finding it, if you're hearing it in your local language too. So people are squirming, they're trying to walk away, but the facilitator will continue to insist that they stand there. The crudity is essential, it's a big part of it, right? When they go back to their uh, village, they actually map out the entire uh, sanitation profile. These are the houses, it's actually done in color also, uh, so that you can, <laughs> you know, the point strikes home a little bit more. And these are the um, places where we all defecate. And I think that, you know, as people sit there and participate in that exercise, the realization so totally dawns. They're surrounded in shit. And this is a daily, you know, daily practice. Getting everybody involved is the very critical part of it. Everyone has to be, because it's 100% uh, you know, um, usage of the toilets or nothing, right? You don't get the benefits if it's not 100%. Another interesting exercise, this was in the Philippines. This, this uh, CLTS is happening all over the world, actually. So the facilitator uh, takes a glass, takes a bottle of water, uh, pours it into the glass and offers it to people and say, would you like to, a glass of water? And they would go, sure, right? And then, he takes, asks somebody for a hair from their head, dips it in shit, puts it into the glass, and say, now would you like that water? People are completely revolted, understandably, right? In one village, apparently the villagers just ran away because they were so disgusted, right? But the facilitator says, this is what is happening every single day. A fly, the, the common house fly, has legs that are as thin as the human hair, except they're serrated, so they can actually hold on to more waste. And they go around in all these open defecation areas, and then they come and sit on your food and water. And that's exactly what you're having. You're ingesting shit. And at the end of this, the facilitator just goes away. He doesn't lecture to them. He doesn't advise them. He doesn't ask them for commitment. He doesn't say, I will tell you, I will help you build your toilets. He goes away, leaving them to stew on this. And very soon, in, uh, in a very short time, the community builds their own toilets. They don't need external assistance to figure out what is the um, technology, what is the model, what is the fi you know, where is the money going to come from. Uh, in closing, I want to say that you know, social problems, tackling social problems, societal behavior change, it requires getting your hands dirty. You're going to have to go deep in, understand the context, and then design your solutions that will work in that uh, context. Thank you very much.